is the main difference between a book and ourselves as a human being? I mean, how much of yourself is in your books, in your research, and how much as you, of you as a human being? I mean, when I came to meet you, yeah. and still we know each other only virtually because of the pandemic, uh, I mean, after having read what you did in bioethics, in ethics, uh, I came to know a human dimension that was uh, wonderful, mm. amazing. Uh, um, what do you think? How much of yourself uh, goes well, into a I, book? Yeah, I, I think uh, you probably know better than I do. It's, mm. uh, it depends who, who's writing the book. For me, when I, mm -hmm. for me, a book uh, is always, there's always some, there's always, there's always a biographical context mm -hmm. for the book. I, I, I find it for me a, a difficult. I can't imagine writing a book without my own personal investment in it. Mm -hmm. And I personally, in terms of my past, uh, struggles that I face in the current, in the present, um, context issues that are existing that I'm personally involved in, not cerebrally, but, uh, more fully. It's a heart and mind a symbiosis here. Mm -hmm. So I think that the book is this kind of objective, uh, sort of a, a objective imprint, perhaps a, a, a tr an attempt at what's perhaps going on inside, but it's never, it's never ever finished. There's never, it's all, the book is unfinished always. It's like Schubert's symphony. It's an, it's an, unfin it's an unfinished symphony, mm -hmm. right? There's right? nothing completed always. And it's just one strain of thought uh, among mm -hmm. a long strain of thought because mm -hmm. we're always on each other's shoulders. Yeah. So with my conversations with you, uh, you certainly impact how I think. That's, that comes forth in, in my work later on and in, in my interaction later on. We mm -hmm. all impact each other. Of course, the, the secret lies in being open, having that open, open mind, open heart, and just, just, and just you know, learning. There's a, lot, there's a lot that we say to each other, but there's also a lot that we, left, uh, le that we leave unsaid. And often that's there, that's more important things yeah but it's difficult you know isn't it during this whole time because yeah. we haven't had that luxury of physical physically being with others and it's very difficult because right now even now right now we're having a screen interaction but it's not the same as interpersonal interaction as you know you know you know this better than i do so anyway but i think a book is, you know, it's, it's difficult uh, to write a book, but a book is just a book. It's, you work at it, you start off with a blank page, but you're actually writing, for me, I don't know about you, for me, I'm always writing when I'm not writing. Mm. In other words, I'm constructing mm -hmm. ideas mm -hmm. when I'm washing the dishes <laughs> or right. when I'm outside with Brooke and we're working outside in the yard or when I'm bike, on a bicycle, bike, biking, or even when I'm well, swimming, perhaps, mm. even though I shouldn't be thinking when I'm swimming, I, I should be, I should be in the moment, but things just come when, yeah, you're writing when you're not in front of the desk. It's that desk that's always threatened, isn't it? Both you know? for the reader and uh, for the writer, I guess. And for the writer, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you heard of Studs Terkel? Uh, no, writer? tell me. He's often written about the working class. Uh -huh. And he was once asked, How is, what is writing like? He said, oh, writing is really quite easy. It's all, all you have to do is open your vein and then bleed all over the page. <laughs> it's, 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 it's always hard. It's always hard because the words never capture whatever, whatever I'm feeling and whatever I, I'm thinking. It's so true. Yeah, but for some reason, we, uh, we, we feel compelled to write. I don't know why. For me, I have to write 
because otherwise a certain ideas, a certain problems uh, will never leave me alone. <laughs> I mean, I when I finish a book, I feel that, uh, okay, I did my part in this world in relation to this problem. The problem will still be going, but I put together uh, you know, all my thoughts about uh, these difficult issues, uh, it, it, it give me some peace uh, somehow. I don't know. Uh, what about you? No, that, that's, that's uh, I feel very much like that too. Yeah, mm. it's, it's an expression that you need to somehow share. Yeah. It's, uh, for me, it's a matter of sharing it. Uh, it's, not, it's more than a diary. A diary is uh, very personal. But this is a diary that you hope to share. I'm very interested in uh, the historical background of my parents, my mother and father. You know, I was born in Japan. Right. And my mother was born in Japan. I, I was born just after or during the occupation of the American forces. That's how old I am. I was during the American occupation after the war. And I'm reading now about uh, the situation in Japan during that time, a very, I'm interested in that because it helps me to understand the context of my mother and what she was going through as a young woman. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, she used to give, tell me stories about planes would fly overhead where she lived and uh, they would, everyone would go to the hole in the ground in the backyard, a small yard, because they dug a hole oh. in case the dr bombs dropped. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the bombs never dropped. They went to the other part of Japan, to Tokyo and other places. Mm -hmm. But the town I was born in, Fukuoka, that was actually targeted for the second atom bomb. The bomb never dropped in, in Fukuoka, in Kyushu, the southern island. It never dropped there because the, the cl it was too cloudy. So instead, the plane went to Nagasaki. See? So... If, if, if it weren't for the clouds, I wouldn't be here <laughs> speaking wow. with you. Wow, <laughs> wow. Right? Such a matter of clouds, yeah. actually. Oh, yo, yo. Yeah, when you, yeah, when you think of the force of fate and destiny wow. and how things, uh, how things happen in life. Do you so believe I'm sure in you, destiny? Same thing with you. Same thing with you. When you look back, you see all these dots that you can now connect. Yeah. That maybe didn't make so much sense then. But now they're connecting, you know, yeah. so it's, it's interesting. Do you yeah. think that fate is a postdoc? Uh, it's something that uh, reveals itself uh, in uh, the afterwards? Uh, or uh, is there, uh, you know, is present as an agent uh, actually driving our life? What's, yeah, what are, uh, I, think, I, think, I think it depends upon how aware we are. Mm. Our attentiveness. I mean, that's very Italian. La forza del destino, or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, 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 la forza del destino. Yeah, lightning. Uh -huh. The uh, 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 the fate as lightning. You know, it's uh, the crash. And if you're aware of it, you know, you're aware of this this happening when mm -hmm. you see someone and you know you're meant somehow your destinies are me meant to be linked, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of awareness. And, mm -hmm. But I think most of us don't have that. I don't know. I can't. I think a lot of us go through life sleepwalking and mm -hmm. we're, less, we're less aware, especially with our, our devices now and our technologies. We're even, we're even less aware of what's happening all around us. So our world is more or less on the screen mm -hmm. and it's not outside the screen. Just like and it's no different from philosophy, you know, when philosophy becomes very compartmentalized and over analytical and systematic right. and, and, it's, and it's compressed in a silo, mm -hmm. philosophy in this silo where philosophers are arguing with each other over some abstract idea that has, that most people cannot relate to. Uh, unless you're actually in that field, but it has no real bearing beyond that field. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you can live in your head, but 
the challenge in philosophy and the challenge, especially in philosophy, because that's an occupational hazard in philosophy is to end up with your living in your head. And the challenge is to see and wake up to the world beyond your head. Mm -hmm. Wake up to the world. It's an, it's an amazing world outside, mm -hmm. outside there. That's a beautiful world. <laughs> it's a cruel world, but it's also a beautiful world. <laughs> Full of surprises, well, fortunately. Yeah, surprises. <laughs> As the Irish say, it's a terrible, there's a terrible beauty in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a terrible horror. Yeah. Look, how much of uh, all this intention is in your uh, wonderful uh, last book, Revolutionary Bioethics? I mean, how much did you manage to express about uh, this importance of uh, going beyond the screen, but also about your heritage? Because, uh, you yeah. know, the secondary resources uh, that you bring in, your, uh, in yeah. your book are particularly careful to create uh, this bridge between uh, East and West. Uh, yes. Uh, how much in, of this uh, went into your last effort? It's inescapable that much goes into it. Mm -hmm. But the challenge in writing an academic book mm -hmm. is that there's, a, there's always that other part of you realize that uh, how it's going to be peer reviewed. Mm. And maybe there's a lot more critical, there are more critical eyes looking at the book, which is good very good in many ways it's very good because because it keeps me grounded in what my intention was but i, I have to be, but i can't personalize the book as much as i would want to mm -hmm. this is why uh, i this is why i'm not sure i want to ever i'm not sure i'm going to publish again academically oh, okay. uh, i'm not sure i will because i it's a long process a long, long process. You first have to get the proposal, as you know, accepted. Mm -hmm. And God only knows who are these individuals who are particularly evaluating the worth of your proposal. You wonder. And then, then once you get it done and then you send it to others for their reviews, it takes a long process. And today, you it seems that uh, there's you can you can write your be more personal mm -hmm. and be more free and write more freely and uh, still be able to get your book published. Of course, it's difficult. This, you know, the, the idea, for instance, if I go the path of self-publishing, uh, that's usually a scar, you know, a blemish academically, because uh, we academics, we have this kind of thing about, well, that's not really academic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's really academic and really mm -hmm. what is academic i mean it's so this whole game mm -hmm. of academia that's precisely what philosophers need to challenge mm -hmm. i mean yeah. that's, that's that's what philosophy is all about it's you know challenging mm -hmm. the status quo that was one of your questions it's all about challenging the status quo challenging the system challenging the establishment this is why I'm fond of uh, philosophers who, who do that, who challenge the system. And they take, the, they're willing to go outside their comfort zone. Now, Susie, writing this last book was clearly going outside my comfort zone. Why? Because I, I'm not at all well-versed in cognitive science. That wasn't my background. And I'm not at all well-versed in robotics. Mm -hmm. So I had to do a lot of homework, a lot of reading, a lot of background. Now, I mean, there was, there was this was a lot of reading and that led me to the idea and led me to write what I've written. But then once it's published, and I think it'll be published uh, in 2022, it'll be published probably July, uh, February maybe, uh, we'll see. Once it's published, then you have the marketing. It's not going to reach mm -hmm. the kinds of people that I would want it to reach. And mm -hmm. that's another angle, the marketing. Right. You know, right. whether your press is going to market your book. That's always frustrating for, for us. I know. Always frustrating. I don't know about you, but it's frustrating. It's always been frustrating for me. Uh, your, your book that you edited, 
technobioethics, I remember that, that's, you know, I mean, that should be accessible to the general public because there's some wonderful issues there. And there, there are, you know, a lot of people would be clearly engaged, find that engaging, but no, it's limited because of however it's going to be marketed, you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's just one open access chapter, which, by the way, costs uh, lots of money to the university. Yeah. So it's uh, not, yeah, this is a big problem, the democratization yeah, right. of the resources uh, in general, yes. not just in academia. Everybody yeah. should be able to access. Uh, I agree. Resources. I agree with you totally on that. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. So have you thought about, are you going to, you're still young, so you're too young to be, to reach the, the you know that that uh, plat that i'm going i'm down here see i'm down the oh well part of my ride <laughs> you're still having a great ride so but i just hope that uh the future of academic publishing i hope your publishers i hope they f see the wisdom in in uh in somehow broadening their marketing efforts. Otherwise, academic, academia and philosophy in particular, because we're philosophers, uh, we're st we stay in jeopardy of remaining a silo yep. apart from the, from, our, from the rest of the world. Uh, we remain in this kind of esoteric, isolated, yeah. special group of thinkers when, when in truth, we're everyone, everyone, who breathes is a philosopher. That's our past part of our nature. If I think of how I started, uh, I'm from the 80s, uh, how difficult it was to get a book during my PhD. I mean, I had to take a plane to actually get a book from really? Husserl. I mean, I was working on a famous philosopher. Really? How easy it is today, I mean, easier. I feel optimistic that probably uh, resources will be made more available, but we need to put an effort. I mean, we need to demand it. Yes, I agree. Yes. And we need to give up on the dream of uh, receiving some financial support. Yes, exactly. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, outcome. Ready the writing. best seller, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right, so, that's right. <laughs> it this must be no, on true. both sides. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, Michael, for some reason, while we were talking, uh, it came to my mind an image. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Marina Abramovic, uh, with uh, one of her uh, performances. You know, uh, there's this artist uh, who in New York uh, decided to uh, sit herself at a table. There was uh, this desk, uh, a table, uh, and in front of her, uh, uh, anybody could see. So she would go uh, at the museum uh, and sit there from the morning until the evening for, uh, I don't remember how many days, uh, four or five days, uh, people came, nobody or a very little people sat, nothing happened. Then what did she do? She removed the desk. Oh. I, I, somehow I'm thinking about, uh, you know, this uh, publishing process, academia, the desk, how difficult yes. is writing. So she removed the desk and people sat and the outcome was uh, incredible. I mean, the performance actually started. People were crying, were... Uh, you oh. could see how... Wow. This encounter uh, of faces, uh, and I know that you worked uh, on the meaning of the face, this encounter of faces uh, was so yes. powerful uh, that yeah. people uh, opened up. Oh, wow. And there was an actual transformation. I don't know uh, if, uh, if we could remove uh, this desk, uh, you know, the heaviness uh, of uh, the ritual of writing, academic process yes. uh, I don't know other people that uh, criticize yeah. the little term and so on 
what would uh, our soul say about uh, what your soul, because this is a question for you, actually, what your soul would say about, uh, you know, what you wrote recently or what you've been through recently? What's the, the main message you think it would came out if uh, this desk uh, were removed what's uh, what's about the well-being uh, technology the future uh, that is uh, so pressing for you to say what do you think that's that's a that's a great that's a great question great question and it's a really great image and i like that uh, it's example. A powerful image. that's a great example that is a great example so in her case the removal of her desk made all the difference Completely. and how people saw her and how they felt free to engage with her, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we all have these desks, especially intellectuals, especially academics. Mm -hmm. We have these desks. Uh, and it's a matter of removing that. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Buddhism is, I've always yeah. been drawn to Buddhism. And I, that's what I used to first study. In fact, mm -hmm. my dissertation was on comparative philosophy. And so I was very engaged in Buddhist studies and comparing Buddhism with phenomenology. Buddhism is intensely profound, not in an intellectual sense, the challenge that it presents. And the challenge is this, is this. Forget about all the Buddhist theories and all the schools of thought and all of that. They also, they all center around one idea. The one idea, and it's the most difficult one, it's the most difficult idea, is to be where you are. Mm -hmm. Be, it's to be where you are and with whom you are. Mm -hmm. To be where you are. That's hard because instead of a desk, instead of a desk, for me, my desk is my mind, my brain. So while you're speaking, or with, for instance, here's an example. I'm speaking with you. So I may be already, my brain is the desk between us because I'm already thinking about what I'm going to say mm -hmm. in response to you. Mm -hmm. So which means I'm not really listening to you i'm already thinking ahead mm -hmm. and that acts as my desk mm -hmm. so the most difficult challenge that i found in buddhism and i and i found that this is why i'm drawn to buddhist and because that's 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 really what it's to me i believe that's the most that's what is where it starts is to be with a person to be with the other to be mm -hmm. with with you to be mm -hmm. with someone i'm to be with brooke yeah so brooke at the end of the day brooke is on the phone all day mm -hmm. she, with her job oh, okay. non-stop I, I could never do that never <laughs> because <laughs> i i just can't i'm just not of that of that ilk i can never do that Anyway, she's speaking with her clients. She's speaking with uh, her team. She, uh, she works for IBM and she's working with her team there and all of this. And, and then at the, when we get together at the end of the day for dinner, she'll talk about her day. And uh, I'm just like, I'm astounded how much energy she has to do that. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't have that energy. It's, so, it's, so I'm listening. But after a while, it's hard to really listen because mm -hmm. it's, you know, being fully present. Mm -hmm. It's it's difficult. It's, but I, I do it. But I'm because my mind is thinking this. My mind is thinking of well, what are we what about tomorrow? Why not? Well, we'll be going for uh, for dinner. What are we gonna have for dinner? <laughs> something like something really crazy. You think crazy your like wife that. has uh, a, a trick for us uh, about how to stay present, even if uh, there's a phone, even if uh, she cannot see she, the other yeah, person. She definitely, yeah, she definitely has a, has a, has a secret. <laughs> I'm still trying to tap into it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> we all, in our relationships, we learn all, always about ourselves in our relationships. And uh, that's the saving quality of, re, of, of good relationships. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, but that's that desk, that image of the desk, that's our mind. So, and we, uh, we can't, we carry our mind with us everywhere, just like we carry a desk. Mm -hmm. And uh, that interferes. It gets worse when other accoutrements are part of the package. Mm -hmm. Now we see this in, for instance, in healthcare. For example, I, I went to see my doctor uh, yesterday for a for a annual physical. What was wonderfully refreshing about my doctor mm -hmm. is that he looked at me eye to eye and we had a oh. conversation. Yeah. He wasn't on a laptop asking me yeah. all these questions. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you know, what medication am I on? Or am I still taking this? Or, or he wasn't, because the laptop is the desk. The de laptop is the interference. We see this very much in healthcare, don't we? We see, uh, we see the laptop is the third party in the room. Mm -hmm. You have the doctor or the nurse and the patient and the patient who's waited for, you know, for a long time for this appointment. And there's the professional. And then you have the computer, you have the desk, the laptop. Mm -hmm. Patients know when someone's really there with them. We all know that. We Completely. sense that. Yes. You, we sense that. If, you know, when you're having a kind, when we, you know, when uh, hopefully someday you'll come to visit us in Rhode Island, and uh, I would love to. when we have this, we have this conversation face to face. You'll know. If my mind is elsewhere, you'll know that. <laughs> Just like Brooke knows it. We know, <laughs> we know when all of a sudden there's this deck desk that uh, surfaces. <laughs> Michael, Funny. big question here. Do you think that today the desk is the way in which we become we become professionals? I mean, it seems very much that uh, this desk must be there, uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, the doctor is not a doctor, uh, the teacher is not a teacher, and so on. But yeah, yeah. is it uh, being a professional, uh, creating this kind of uh, aloofness of detachment? Mm -hmm. Isn't yeah. very? Well, it's not an aloofness. I, don't ah. see I think what it is, it is, is an engagement. Mm. Because the desk, mm. we need we need to know about the patient, don't we? Right? We need mm -hmm. to know mm -hmm. about her history or right. his history. We need to know the medical history. Right. We need to know more. Right. But the trick lies in not ha allowing the desk or the mind to interfere okay. with the interaction with the patient, with me, mm -hmm. uh, because as much as our conversation may flow a certain way, how I react, how I listen, and how he speaks, all of that is a language too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you play a mus musical instrument? Oh yeah, do you piano. Do, what do you, piano, okay, right. you? I do too. Oh, nice. Our, yeah. Maybe so we play you have to play on our piano. <laughs> yeah. We have a piano here. Uh -huh. It's a digital piano. Uh -huh. Anyway, I was I took piano lessons. And uh, I don't know how long, how long you took piano lessons, but I took piano lessons. I was forced to take piano lessons. I hated it. I was first grade. My mother said, you have to take piano lessons. I said, why? <laughs> so Me? I said, okay, because uh -huh. first grader, you know. Six years old, you're very docile, and you say, "Okay, I will do it." Seventh grade, second grade comes. I'm still taking piano lessons. Third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, still taking piano lessons. Fifth grade, you start thinking, you know, I want to go outside and play with my friends. My teacher is saying, "Michael, you play well, mm -hmm. but you're just playing the notes." Mm. So I looked at her, of course, wondering, <laughs> well, all I see is the notes. That's why am I supposed uh -huh. to play the notes? Uh -huh. She said, no, if you want to really play, mm -hmm. you have to play the space between the notes also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So I had no idea what she was talking about. Only, <laughs> only, only later, years later, did I realize mm-hmm. it's the space between the notes that creates the notes. Mm-hmm. You see? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so when we only, so it's, it's a Buddhist idea. When we look at life, when we interact with our music, with another person, it's that space that the interaction relies on also also it's mm-hmm. not just the words that we do but how we are with each other mm-hmm. so this is the idea of that brain being the desk and the mind being the desk the idea of being present mm-hmm. which is really difficult it's the most difficult thing in the world because we think Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with thinking, but we think. Yeah, let me tell you, let me share you a story with my Please grandfather. Do. Yeah. My father, my grandfather. When I, I was excited about philosophy, when I was a young boy, I read a book by Will Durant, mm-hmm. a philosopher, called The Story of Philosophy. So here I am, I was about in fifth grade or so. I'm reading this paperback book called The Story of Philosophy. And I thought, these, these, these guys like Socrates and Plato, they're really, really cool. I mean, interesting persons. I was reading this book Mm -hmm. and I told my grandfather and he was outside his yard with, he had a pipe and he's from Ireland. And I said, Hey grandpa, I'm reading this book. Uh, Because he was always interested in what I was reading. And he asked me, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading a book called the story of philosophy. I said, it's really interesting. I think I want to be a philosopher. And he looked at me and he said, and he's piping, smoking his pipe. He said, Michael, he said, there's an old Irish saying, uh, you can never plow a field by turning it over in your mind. I know. And I said, and again, just like piano, my piano teacher, I had no idea what he was talking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was, you know, I had no clue. What, what is mm-hmm. he talking about? So, but after years, after years, I realized, and I would go back to him and I would say, but grandpa, don't you have to really think about how you're going to plow the field before you plow the field? <laughs> and he just looked at me, you know, so he knew that I still didn't get it. But after all these years, yes, uh, he, I realized that it's the same idea, the same mm-hmm. idea of not letting your your mind is not the world. You still mm-hmm. have to plow the field. Mm-hmm. You see, you have to be there to plow the field. Mm-hmm. Of course, of course, like the doctor, you have to know how to plow the field, mm-hmm. right? Like we're teaching in our we're teaching our students. You're teaching your class. You have to know the subject matter, Mm -hmm. but there's more to teaching than just Mm -hmm. sharing that. It's interact. It's how you express express those ideas as well in your classroom. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be in your class in your classroom someday. Yeah, let's do it soon. (laughs) Next semester. Yes. Okay. Good. 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 I'll sit in the back. I'll be very quiet. I would love to. Yeah, I I completely agree with you and uh, you gave me a new perspective because sometimes I get frustrated with the desk yeah. and I have uh, the instinct of uh, throwing it away, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> but you're right, I mean, uh, there is the desk, we need the desk, uh, yeah. but the pauses, uh, the in-between, uh, the how is very important we need to be present uh, in these moments so yeah the doctor um, the the way in which we receive care for example Uh, i mean yeah there is a computer you need to keep an eye on the computer that's right you know the in between uh, is uh, the magic is where you establish the connection and you realize ah okay my doctor cares about me or my patient cares about me i mean uh, I was in a visit uh, recently as well, uh-huh. and I truly asked my doctor, how are you? I mean, she was <laughs> looking a little pale and tired, and, so on. and I got actually worried about her. And I asked her, 
how are you doing? And she realized, she understood that uh, it wasn't just saying that I asked her for a reason and uh, <laughs> she got startled. <laughs> That's funny. That's great. That's a great uh, story. Now, if you, right. if, you went to, if you went to see a wearing a white coat with the stethoscope and you asked, how are you feeling? It'd be different, right? Will be completely different. Yes, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's always uh, you know a setup about the meaning so that uh, we can gain from a certain experience. Yeah. But the intentions of the presence is. Uh, yeah. How did she respond to that? She was in, she was really startled, and uh, then she got offended a little, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> You cross the line. You cross the line. I no. I think that uh, she, uh, she. It was a she. So uh, uh, she told me, you know, don't, "Don't I look good enough?" I mean, what's uh, what's the problem? I said, "No, I'm sorry. It's just that uh, you know, you look a little pale and with uh, heavy <laughs> breathing." Uh, really? So yeah, I thought uh, that you were not having uh, a good day and. Uh, yeah, just oh, that. Wow. And then wow. she got really soft and warm toward me. Yeah. She realized that there was an actual process of thinking about her in that moment. Yeah. And yeah. so I had the feeling that the desk in that moment was completely removed. Yeah. And there yeah. were two human beings that were caring for each other. That's, in, yeah, that's great. In the doctor's office. Yeah. yeah. What a great, what a great, that was a great moment. Yeah. It was a great moment for her. Yeah, <laughs> I hope absolutely. so because poor doctor, so ask them how they are doing. That's true. And, and uh, they they face so much pressure. My God, and, you know they have to fill in the dots. They have to fill out the forms. And yeah, there's so much pressure on by the hospital, the institution. And here, that's fabulous. <laughs> it reminded her that she's still human. She's still human. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, we both we both work in bioethics, and we know how high is the number of suicide among uh, doctors, uh, how difficult it is to end ethical schools, uh, what yeah. biases are uh, around the doctors uh, who go into um, psychotherapy just to receive some help. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, creating. Uh, mutual care is um yeah it might be magic every once in a while right that is fabulous that's great yeah that's wonderful i think yeah. it uh, it helps well and yeah. you know uh, it, it may it might be true for teachers for writers uh, to to receive <laughs> the vice versa question right uh, to, to to have the student asking uh, i don't know uh, how I, which is what we're doing with this podcast i mean how much yeah. of this idea has changed your life how much of um, to yes. what extent the reading about this philosopher brought you in a path instead of another mm -hmm. yeah. i mean you just yeah. told me this beautiful story of your grandfather and the discovery of this book i mean yeah it changed your well, life yeah it'd be interesting to ask learn from the students ask them the students will be watching this. What uh, what what are the memorable and the striking features uh, mm. of their of their philosophy classes? Mm -hmm. Was it the professor? Was there an actual moment? Was there a moment where there was a so sort of an enlightenment or an awakening, or where there was a tension broke? Mm -hmm. uh, because that's that. It'd be interesting to learn from the students. We need to do that more, you know, like maybe your doctor realized that, gee, I can, I need to, I can learn more from my own patients. They have so much to teach me about not only themselves, but myself. So we, there's so much we can learn from our students too. How would you reply to this question, Ricardo? Hello. Hi. How My are you? Ricardo. I'm good. Good to Thank see you, you. Ricardo. Good to see you as well. You're looking good. You look you look like an actor, a very famous actor. Today is modeling. We have everything. Brain, amazing. Look, it's incredible, really? right? <laughs> Ma, fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
to answer the question, uh, for me, uh, philosophy, the biggest things have really been the, the, the teachers and yeah. uh, seeing them engage with students, uh, having different characters and trying to actually get them to, uh, you know, think about things more philosophically yes. um, yeah. along with the content because the content is does carry over into daily life um, yeah. mm-hmm. very often without yeah. even being recognized. And I think with a little bit of that space that you guys were mentioning earlier um, and actually like, you know, feeling it, not necessarily thinking about it, Mm -hmm. um, there could be a lot more gratitude and uh, education and talking to one another. Yeah, that's great. That's nice. That's thank you. That's that was well, well said. You said you when you mentioned feeling as well as thinking about it, that was interesting that you that you mentioned that, that you stress that because feeling, do you feel more alive when, when an idea, when you feel the uh, idea that the professor is sharing, feel it more or thinking about it? Is you see philosophy more as it emotive or cognitive or both? I see it as both, um, um, but, for me, it's the sensation is what like gives it the vigor that uh, kind of drives the the thinking aspect of it. Because then yeah. the thinking, like in retrospect, I can actually you know do something a little bit more appropriate, or I can um, you know help those around me actually you know because I'm uh, engaging with philosophy, they also engage with philosophy. So I feel like it extends yeah. out. Yeah, outward. yeah, yeah. I see. And then we become. I- like more rigorous into like actually um, developing the thinking. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Do you do you have conversations with with others in the class after the class? Yes, I do. Yeah, that's great. That's I tr- great. um unfortunately with the um the whole online stuff like that, it's yeah. a been, it's been a little bit difficult to engage with students um, mm. because yeah. I, I pride myself to be you know there in the moment and you know on time good attitude and i'm pretty sure things will just follow follow along but yeah. with the zoom thing it's like okay goodbye have a nice day yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh so you don't have the in person classes yet Car- i have Car- i have one with one of my professor for epistemology okay all right okay and uh, that's a, doing- that's a that's a necessary <laughs> subject you can't be zooming with the epist- through with epistemology <laughs> that's that's great that's fabulous uh, so are you are you a philosophy major? Yes, I am. Oh, so you found out, you heard, you must have heard that philosophers make the most money. It's the highest paid, in, you know, profession, right? I've heard that, yes, but yes. that's not why I got into it. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I once said that to a class, you know, that because I could tell they were drifting off. I said, hey, by the way, you know, according to Money Magazine, did you know the top paid profession of philosophers? They all of a sudden all woke up. It's a great experience. <laughs> but you know, many philosophers, I mean, philosophers are needed in so many areas that uh, <clears throat> yeah. you might right. not expect. Because as you, as you were saying, uh, we need to think about how to do things. And so, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. philosophers yeah. are more or less needed in any area of uh, work. And it's yeah. a pity for me to see so many students are giving up on majoring or minoring in philosophy because they say, okay, I have to make money and so I cannot study philosophy. And it's a pity because they might come back later in life and they think, oh my God, I, I missed uh, this train, I missed this moment uh, uh, to, to get myself time to think. Yeah, and yeah. I keep saying, uh, you know, a, a minor in philosophy is always helpful because uh, you can't imagine how many areas of um, yeah, yeah. of work is required. Yeah. yeah. I, Let me ask you both. Do you think that when we teach philosophy, do you think it ought to be taught? You think it's taught too early because we normally teach philosophy in, the, in America. We teach it first year in college. This is, this is when we start. Mm-hmm. Students have just left high school and they're all excited about college life. 
So freshmen, freshmen are often you know, may well be the least interested <laughs> in <laughs> questioning the things that we've always taken for granted, right? And that's what philosophy is. It's a questioning everything that we've taken for granted. It's a challenging of the status quo. Uh, do you think that that's too early? Do you think we should wait later until later, maybe until until students get more life experience? Maybe that wait till the third year, the fourth time. year, or even afterwards? I don't know. What do you think? I think it should be introduced a little bit more in the high school. Um, uh, cause my first experience with, uh, philosophy was in college, my freshman year. Uh -huh. Um, and, but I already had prior knowledge to psychology or biology and all these like big subjects. Yeah. Um, yeah. but they were very much more, um, analytical on, uh, how things mm -hmm. are done. Um, mm -hmm. but I never took the time to actually think, figure out why until I got into philosophy. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I think yeah. that, that why yeah. aspect of it is it can't be really um too early to t uh to learn about i just yeah. think it's the material that needs to be a little bit more engaging with right. the competition of right. like youtube television yeah that's, that's hard that's what's really yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 that's that's great yeah i i i see what you're saying ricardo and i agree with you i think it makes sense if we could only get that sense of questioning earlier because after all, as children, we're all philosophers, especially. We're always questioning. But then something happens. Yeah. Something snaps along the way where we're kind of told to remember things, things, things we have to remember. And data, data becomes all important. And then we, we learn the importance of facts. And philosophy tells us that facts and truth are not the same. So truth is what we seek. And so asking why, you know, I think that's that's a great point. If we can instill philosophy. So Susie, your 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 philosophy for kids who are younger, that's great. That's a great, that is a great project. Oh yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And well, in best, Italy. Yeah. Uh-huh. The best students that I've had in the States have been students from other from Europe mm. because they've had philosophy in high school. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had a defunct, our philosophy club in Pittsburgh, uh, we had a, an old, uh, when I taught in Pittsburgh, we used to have a philosophy club, but it withered, uh, you know, withered, withered, withered off the vine until the, we had a group of C Croatian students from Bosnia, oh, uh -huh. and this was during the whole conflict, mm. and Bosnia-Herzegovina, the whole conflict in Croatia. And they were they were the smartest students. They they get they got that philosophy club up and going. We called it they called it the not yet dead philosophy philosophers club. Okay. Not yet dead philosophers club. <laughs> not yet. No, strange time. <laughs> <laughs> it's based on that movie, the Dead Poets right, Society. Right, the Dead Poets. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, that's beautiful. I, I think that it's, yeah, I agree with Ricardo. It's, uh, it's never too early. Uh, I, I would be extremely happy to teach philosophy to children, actually. Yeah. I wrote yeah. fables for, philosophical fables for children. Oh. Yeah, I, I think that oh. children have uh, the most open mind that we can hope for. And yes. it's really fun to interact with them because... Uh, yeah, you are really living in the mental experiment. Anything yeah. is possible still. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you can have space to avoid uh, heavy categories to be, you know, built and in seeded uh, in your head. Yeah. I'd be yeah. really curious. To... That's great. That's well, you have to let keep me, keep me posted as to how that works out. Yeah, let's see if I'll, uh, I'll be able. Yeah. So far, it's just an idea. Yeah. Look, Michael, I idea. want to ask you one uh, last question, which is generally the ritual uh, of, uh, of this podcast. What do you think is the meaning of life? Is what there do I meaning? think is the meaning of life? <laughs> yes. In 10 <laughs> and, minutes? You know, almost everyone reacts <laughs> in this way, I must say. <laughs> oh. Tell me. 
<laughs> the meaning of life is what's just taking place in the last 40 minutes, interacting, being. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the meaning of life is is right here. Uh, meaning of life is living fully in the moment. Uh, I know that sounds irresponsible because it sounds like, well, I, I should care about the future. Of course, we have to care about the future. And of course, we have to respect the past. We have to remember that we're all products of the past. This is why I'm so engaged in learning more about my past with my parents, you know, mm -hmm. in Ireland and Japan. Uh, we have to know about, the, but, but you know, the only, it's a Zen, it's a Zen thing, you know, Zen Buddhism, the only, pre, the only reality is now, what's mm -hmm. taking place now. And there's a Japanese phrase, it's called Ichigo Ichie. Mm -hmm. Ichigo Ichie. And it's a phrase that relates to the tea ceremony. Mm. And the idea in the tea ceremony is that full attentiveness, full awareness, and the idea that it will never, ever be repeated. It will never come again. Yeah. This moment will never come again between mm -hmm. the three of us, Ricardo, myself, and Susie. Mm -hmm. Never. It will never come back. Mm -hmm. And if we can embrace each moment like that, uh, especially when we're with the other, mm -hmm. I, to me, that's, you know, I mean, the meaning of life, you know, of course, we're going to die. But death is not the opposite of life. Death is the opposite of birth. See, birth leads to death, but it's all part of the dance of life. Uh, we're alive every moment. I mean, this is it. And so the question is, the question is never, uh, is there life after we die? The question is, is, is there life before we die? <laughs> <laughs> now, are we alive now? Yeah. Or are we with the walking dead? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting how our films, you know, depict our our interests in them, uh -huh. you know, right? That yeah. idea. But that's that is that is. Uh, I know that sounds simplistic. It sounds probably sophomoric and juvenile. But uh, I don't know. I, I just believe that the meaning of life is living. That doesn't mean living irresponsibly, but living giving your fullest. So what Albert Camus said: our best investment in the future is to give all to the present. It's funny how his book, The Plague, has become really a bestseller ever since the pandemic. Pandemic, everyone's reading the philosophy. Huh? Can you imagine? <laughs> so, how we, it takes a crisis to, <laughs> to uh, have us, you know, start reading things. These, <laughs> but then once we start yeah, starting back to, you know, once we start, uh, I, I my fear that uh, that we may not have learned our lessons from this whole pandemic is that. We may just want to get back to business as usual and just live, you know, just continue on with our consumer world. And that's the uh, thing about what's great about crises like the pandemic is that they're all will always litmus tests. They're, they're awakening, wake up calls. They kind of challenge us as to what, who we are, what are we made of and what really matters in our lives. Anyway, thanks so much, uh, Susie and Ricardo, for uh, for inviting me to this. <clears throat> it's an honor. It's it really a pleasure. Is. Yeah, it's it's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.